All right, I think we'll get started then. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Zoom edition of Dining to Learn. Today, we have a really engaging and funny and informative presentation from Dr. Gordon Thomas from the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Center and the University of Ottawa. And before giving the presentation over to Dr. Thomas, I just want to go over a few quick points. Uh, first, if you have any questions for Dr. Thomas during his presentation, please write these questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We're not going to wait till the end of the presentation to ask questions. Just ask your questions throughout the presentation and we'll kind of uh, mingle the Q&A throughout the talk. Uh, because we have such a large group for this series, participants won't be able to unmute or to turn on their videos. So please direct your questions to the chat box. And second, if you want to receive a certificate of attendance for these sessions, you must complete a brief online evaluation, which I'll provide you at the end of the session. And I'm gonna also email it out to you at least a week after the session. <coughs> and third, a recording of the presentation will be available afterwards on YouTube. We'll also email out the slide deck to everyone after. And fourth, uh, Ottawa area long-term care staff are eligible to receive $15 gift certificates to Boston Pizza after each live Zoom session attended for up to $45 in total. To receive the gift certificates, Ottawa area long-term care staff must attend the live Zoom session and complete the post-session survey. And I, these gift certificates will be emailed out to those who qualify approximately one to four weeks after each session. Okay, so I hope that clears things up a bit for everyone. And over to you, Dr. Thomas. Thanks so much for being here again. Well, thank you, Carl. I really appreciate that. I hope I, hope I can live up to that, uh, that introduction <laughs> of being engaging and humorous. Yeah, absolutely you will. <laughs> I guess the pressure's on, that's okay. So. Um, as as Carl mentioned, I'm a I'm a, one of the doctors from the Royal. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, and I do mostly rural outreach. And uh, I just came back from uh, Pembroke this afternoon, uh, which was done all by Zoom as well. So my commute was about thirty seconds long, uh, probably actually shorter than that. And uh, through that, we we see a lot of uh, a lot of the people I see is are have dementia and and various types of dementia. And so that was part of what prompted us to um, go ahead with this this type of presentation and you're going to see a couple of my colleagues in future sessions talk a little bit more about the details of dementia and treatment. So just as part of our standard disclosure I don't actually have any commercial interests or um, other things that might influence my presentation I'm not we're not going to talk about medications or anything that might be influenced by commercial interests anyway but I thought I'd bring that disclosure. And I do have a, a, a quick disclaimer at the start because one of the things I use a lot in my talks is a bit of humor and a bit of um, making fun of things because when, when we work in geriatric psychiatry, you know, 70, 80% of what I do is seeing folks who have a, a terminal de debilitating degenerative disease that's going to only end one way and, and trying to help them through their struggles and help their families through their struggles. And so part of the way that in medicine we deal with that is through humor to make it feel a little bit less tragic and help us cope. So I always bring that disclaimer out. Just my, my goal is to try to entertain and, and inform and break some of the, the, the stress and the worry and the, the fear that comes with these illnesses rather than it, it's not my intent to offend or to make fun of them. So I just wanted to bring that, put that out there so that people know where I'm coming from in case something just seems a little off, the note is a little bit off. So our goal for today, we're gonna to talk about what dementia is and how it differs from normal aging. Um, through that process, you're probably gonna look at some of the things and go, hmm, that happens to me. But a lot of, a lot of normal aging also involves a little bits of memory change and that's not the same thing as dementia and we'll talk about why that is and, and how, to, how we tell the difference between it. We're gonna talk a little bit about how common dementia is, how common the different types of dementia is and how that 
plays in with the implications of the baby boom that we're well really starting in in the middle to get to the close to the middle of now and then we're going to review the types of dementia and their presentations particularly the the four most common types of dementia but also a few other um, features the the less common contributions of, of cognitive impairment so we're going to start out with a poll question so uh, I think Brittany's going to pop that up for us, but we're just going to talk about a little bit about how, how dementia has, has an impact on your lives. Oh, I'm not allowed to vote? That's too bad. <laughs> and it's a multiple choice one, so you can pick, uh, you can pick any of them that, that apply, I think. Okay, so now are it, the audience is able to see the results of the poll too? Are we able I to share that so. with them? Oh, yes, I think. Okay, they good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we can, there's a few of you, it's new, but uh, uh, not unsurprisingly, there's lots of folks in the audience that uh, provide direct care. Um, and not un, unexpectedly, there's family members and fa or, or families of patients that struggle with dementia. And uh, the, the, the four people at the bottom, you're not alone in worrying that you're developing dementia. I, it's, one of the, it's one of the occupational hazards of working in this area, especially when you know enough to start to worry about the things that are going on, but not feeling confident enough to know that you can just dismiss them. And so that's a very natural feeling. Almost all medical students go through it at various stages. And when you when you work primarily with folks who struggle with it, it can be hard to remember sometimes that there's lots and lots of folks out there that are doing really well and don't have problems. So that's uh, really interesting to know where everybody's coming from. All right, so we're going to actually have another poll. So this one's a little bit more fun, but it's a, it's sort of to highlight the point of our first part of our first point, which is what is dementia and, and what's something you should be worried about and what something you shouldn't. I don't think Brittany's seen the questions before, have you? It's, it feels kind of weird to sit here and wonder if everybody's finding things funny or not. So it's nice, it's nice that I have your, your feedback so I can, I can see that it's actually making somebody smile. Yeah, you're doing great. <laughs> We're so happy everybody is responding to the polls. This is great. Thank you all. I'm really resonating with the last one about the fruitcake. No. <laughs> I have to admit that's actually, that's actually mostly there because of my own personal feelings about fruitcake, which I'm sure all the audience can guess from the way I phrased the question. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So, so as everyone's picked up, so on the first two, obviously we, the, the point, the point I'm trying to make there is there, there's normal things that we all do and it's pretty, it's pretty normal to put down your keys 
and just not be sure where you put them, especially if you had a bad day or you're really busy or you walk in the house and there's, there's seven people all wanting you to do something for them right then and there, you put it down, you forget where it is, but you know, putting them in the, in the freezer or finding them in the toilet or not knowing why they shouldn't go in the freezer. Those are much more worrisome stuff. Um, the second one, when we talk about getting stuck with words, it is, it is pretty common for all of us to get, have a word get stuck here and there. And as we get older, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, that gets a little more frequent, but it's not the same as not being able to think of a very familiar person's name for an entire time or forgetting it altogether. And then the, well, well, my, my joke about liking eating the fruitcake is, is more tongue in cheek. One of the things to keep in mind that, that, forgetting how to make fruitcake because you only make it once a year isn't really all that abnormal and it's uh, you could you could easily have to just go back and double check even though you've done it lots of times that long period of time between them is a is a good opportunity for that that um that memory to atrophy a little bit and not be so easily pulled out and not, not be so confident in it so good so what, what is dementia? So when we talk about dementia, it's not just about forgetting, it's also about a general loss of cognitive function. So you, we generally break down cognition into four, or six, sorry, six big domains. So learning and memory is the really familiar one that everybody would uh, sort of think of when they think about dementia. So that's the ability to learn new information and then recall it again at another time. And that learning of new information can be can be separated by quite a bit of time from the point where you have to recall it, but it has to be stored and then it has to be retrieved. So there's two processes there. Um, language is what you think it might think it is, is the ability to communicate. But one of the important things to think about with language is that there's two really important functions there. There's the ability to express it. So what I'm doing right now in talking and hopefully making sense and stringing my words together in a coherent manner, but you guys are also using language on your end in being able to understand the words and they're not getting jumbled up on the way in so that they're making sense to you. So there's two really important functions there. Uh, social cognition is, is really the, the communication that doesn't involve language. So my ability to, to notice that Brittany was smiling at the polls and, and assuming then that she, was, she found it funny and that's my, that's my social cognition working to let me know what that facial expression means and how I can react to it. Um, it might be meeting someone in the street and understanding that whether they're angry and maybe you need to walk around them or whether they're friendly and they're, wanna, they're gonna stick their hand out and shake your hand because they're, they're happy to see you. So it's that memory and understanding of how we interact socially. Um, complex attention is something we use a lot. So one of the best ways to think about that is to, is to think about processing speeds. So we, we are beings that can focus on one thing at a time. A lot of people talk about multitasking and we're actually, our brains aren't actually able to truly multitask. We can, we can multitask by focusing on one thing and then focusing on another and flipping back and forth really quickly. And that's what all of us are doing right now because you're, you're listening to what I'm saying, you're looking at what's on the screen, you, you maybe is, are either filtering out or paying attention to other things in your environment like your phone or the kids or whatever else is going on. But you're, you're not actually paying attention to all of them at once you're jumping back and forth between them. And that's, that's what complex attention does. And we use our high speed processing to do that. And then executive function is kind of, it's all of the complex stuff that we do. So it's our planning and organizing. It's our ability to um, keep track of multiple tasks that need to be done in the future or currently. It's our ability to plan and organize things. So. A, good, a really good example of that is cooking. So on the surface, cooking might feel like it's a straightforward thing, especially if you're really good at it or you really love it and you do it all the time. But in order to cook a meal, you have to know and plan a lot of stuff. You have to, you have to know who you're cooking for and how, much, how many people, what they like and dislike, what they're allergic to, what you have the ingredients for. And then even once you have all of that, then you need to plan what to start first in order to have it cooked by the time the, the short stuff is, is done. Making sure you're juggling, keeping the pans and, and the pots 
at the right temperatures, that you're stirring things when they need to, to be done. So you're planning and organizing, you're doing a lot of different steps at once. And that's what executive function is really important for. There's a lot of things we do, but cooking is a really good example of it. And then perceptual mortar is, well, the name sort of implies it's, it's our ability to perceive the world, but then our ability to act on it as well. So uh, we test this with things like having someone draw a clock. So you have to be able to perceive what a clock is, remember that, draw the clock, and, and, and get the motor skills to do what you want to do. Copying a, copying a drawing is another great example because you have to be able to visualize and perceive what the, what the image is and then get your muscles to do what you want in order to, to get that to turn out looking similarly. So you can see they're all, they're all really important things that our brain does, but they're all in different domains and they all really require different sets of functioning. So in dementia, in order to qualify for dementia, you have to have significant impairment of one of these six domains and it has to cause impairment in daily functioning. So just having a memory problem, but you function perfectly well in daily life, you do all the complex stuff, you, you feed yourself and move around and you can work and you can do all the things you need to do to survive and thrive, that's not dementia, it's just a memory problem. So it has to be severe enough to actually interfere with daily life functions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about severity. So the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that there's a difference between dementia and normal aging and that some functions stay really stable with older age and some functions deteriorate. And in this first slide, I'll talk a little bit about the stuff that stays stable and, and with some examples to help you sort of understand what I mean. So recognition recall. So that's retrieving information when you have some sort of cueing. So uh, on testing, it's often, you know, a multiple choice or a category cue. So you can remember that the color you're supposed to remember is red, but you can't necessarily pull that out right away without any reminders, but picking it out of a list is becomes much easier. And that stays pretty stable with older age. And anybody who's done any kind of test knows that short answer is a lot harder than multiple choice because if you can see the answer, you might be much more able to pull out the right answer and, and differentiate it from the others. Um, so temporal order recall is an interesting one. It's the ability to recall timing or sequences. So it's remembering that I was living at the retirement home, I fell and broke my hip, then I went to hospital, then I ended up in the nursing home. So that's, that's a, a sequence of events that you'd have to recall. The other thing that's really important with temporal order is, is understanding time itself and, and being able to judge how far in the future something is. So for example, if, if my daughter's coming to pick me up at five o'clock, temp, the temporal order recall means I'm not sitting there at one o'clock wondering where the heck she is. I know that I've still got four hours and lots of time and I can go and read a book or do something else and I'm not sitting there checking my watch and getting increasingly angry at her for not showing up. Um, procedural recall, it's remembering how to do something. So everything from simple of how to brush your hair to how to use your telephone to how to drive a car. So it's all these, it's that combination of the, the remembering the task and getting the muscles to do it. Um, and then attention to simple tasks is pretty stable. So uh, a good example of this is keeping things something in your in your immediate memory. So you've and I, I, I said this to the medical student yesterday when I was practicing my talk, I was going to say you look it up in the phone book and then you get to the phone and, and punch it in. But I don't think I've seen a phone book in the last 10 years. So I I was at a loss to come up with a better analogy other than maybe a, a, a business card on the, on the fridge and then you have to go to the phone. But, uh, and how many of us actually bother to remember phone calls and we just program it once and then never think of it again. But that said, being able to keep that piece of information in your memory for a few seconds while you need it, it is pretty stable. Um, vocabulary tends to actually continue growing. If you're reading and you're engaging and you're learning new things, vocabulary grows. We don't really lose that. And then simple visual spatial tasks. So I'll talk a little bit about what complex means, but simple things like recognizing what a pen is, recognizing a, a family member's face, um, 
are, are things that are very stable and they don't really deteriorate with normal age. And the same with simple abstractions. So being asked how a train and bicycle are alike, those of you who have done testing will know where that comes from, uh, or, or common proverbs, so a rolling stone gathers no moss, and being able to sort of explain what that means and why the proverb is there is pretty pretty uh, stable. Although with that last one, you have to be careful because it has to be a proverb that's common in the, in the culture that you're dealing with because you may not, you may not find someone from another country or another culture would have any idea what the heck we're talking about with stones and moss. So then there's some things that decline, decline slowly with age and it's important to remember slowly because losing these things completely isn't part of the normal normal aging, but they do get a little bit worse with time. So I talked about cued recall being relatively stable, so you might have guessed that delayed free recall or just remembering off the top of your head uh, is does decline a little bit with age. Um, source recall was one when I was preparing for this I hadn't thought of, but it's very true. Remembering where you learned something or remembering where someone said something to you or who you heard say that that gets harder with time. And I've experienced that at least four or five times in the past week. And, and often it leads to you asking the person who said it or telling them the story of them saying it when you don't realize that they actually were the ones that told you that. Um, perspective memory, so remembering to do things. So a really good example, it's relevant for dementia, is remembering to take medications. So remembering to do things on time that you do regularly. So that does get a little bit harder with age. Um, the fourth one's kind of a sad one for most of us because processing speed actually peaks in the early 20s and then declines. And um, I have a colleague who complains a lot that her kids talk too fast and she, she makes it as if it's them that's the problem. They talk too fast. And the sad, the sad reality is it's because our brains aren't processing it as quickly and it just feels like they're on 1.25 times play speed, but it's really because my brain can't keep up with it as quickly and it just feels like they're talking too quickly. Um, and then we talked about simple tasks, attention for simple tasks like keeping a phone number in your mind is stable, but attention for complex tasks like driving um, does decline with time. And so, for example, when driving is a good example because you're watching your speedometer, you're watching the road, you're checking your mirrors, you're maybe talking to the person next to you, you're trying to remember how to get where you're going and where the turn's coming. There's a lot of complex divided attention going on there. And as our brains slow down because of that processing speed issue, we have less capacity to, to keep shifting between all those different tasks as efficiently. And so driving becomes complex tasks like driving become more uh, challenging. Um, and then working memory is a little different than immediate memory. So immediate memory is that, that repeat that 10 digit number from when I, where I wrote it down to where I have to type it in. Working memory is actually taking information and manipulating it and doing something with it, but keeping it all in your mind while you're doing that. So calculating a tip is a, a good example because you have to remember what the original amount is, what the, what the tip amount I'm going to do, and then you have to manipulate those numbers in your mind as you're going. Um, complex visuospatial tasks are things that we're working in two or three dimensions, so a lot of our drawing tasks are actually uh, more complex visual-spatial tasks, even though they're actually simple images, they require a lot more complex processing to get them to turn out correctly. And another good um, real life example is visualizing the arrangement of furniture in a room or what, how, much, how much you could pack away in the back of your car and making it work without actually just fitting it in, taking it out, putting some more stuff in. Those are complex visual spatial tasks. Um, verbal fluency. So while vocabulary is good and you'll have all the words from a category in there, actually generating all the, the four-legged animals you can think of is a little bit more challenging and does deteriorate a bit with time. And the last, the last three kind of all fit together a little bit. So we talked about that social cognition. So mentalizing and inferring the mental state of others is, is one of those tasks. So being able to look at someone's face and guess whether they're happy, whether they're sad, whether they're thinking about something, whether they're ignoring you, that's a, the mentalizing. I don't really like the term, the way it's 
it mentalizing makes me makes me think of a, a a mentalist up there trying to read your mind but in essence that's kind of what we're doing when we're when we're reading nonverbal cues and that does get a little bit more um, hesitant with time and then working with unfamiliar material concept formation abstract thinking mental flexibility all kind of fit in together with that what uh, a lot of us would think of as creativity or um, um, mental gymnastics to be able to come up with new ideas or to to understand new and, and complex um, concepts and and get our minds to work around them and that does get a little bit harder as our, our brains get a little less flexible with age so there's other things that affect your memory and this is a good point so our poll here is what uh, I'd like to know how many of you remember what color the section labeled with A on that tree was. And I'm hoping they can't go back back a slide or two and cheat or anything, but <laughs> some it's some true. folks do. Just, as they're coming in, it's all over the place. Yeah. So the other thing I'll I'll, I'll admit. I, I realized after the fact when I was practicing, I have a lot of jokes about teenagers, but this question was actually the idea of my teenage daughter and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Okay, let's launch the results. All right, that's interesting. So I was expecting it to be about 25%. We're kind of, we're kind of on that, but it's really interesting that I'll just go back a, a page to show you. It's actually yellow. It's the one that people picked the least. <laughs> And green was the one picked the most. But the, the point of this is, is that memory is not just about our function, because we're all at different uh, age groups and all different levels of, of uh, uh, awareness and alertness. And, and some of us are probably tired and some of us are probably ready to go. But if you're not paying attention to something, you're not going to remember it. And that, that tree is part of the background. You, you wouldn't have registered it, you weren't paying attention to it, and you're not going to remember a piece of information that your brain isn't able to, isn't, isn't focused on at least enough to store that piece of information. Because if you think about the environment you're sitting in right now and how many different stimuli there are, so just where I am, I've got the two lights above me. I've got a little basement window that's looking out into, into darkness with the occasional squirrel running by. There's a stuffy that my daughter left on top of my computer, my work computer. There's stuff everywhere, but I'm filtering all of it out and I'm not paying attention to it because what's important is the talk and, and the, what, I'm, what I'm trying to convey. So I would not notice a bug walking across the the tabletop over to the side and I certainly am not going to remember it. The same thing happens with the tree. It's in the background for most people and and some folks do have you know uh, an, um, unusual abilities like like the eidetic memories, the so-called photographic memory, but most people aren't going to remember that very well because it's not something that they focused on and paid attention to. So memory isn't just about what deteriorates with time, it also is about other things that can affect what we retain and what we store. So we're gonna wander into a little bit of abnormality now. Um, there's this entity, mild cognitive impairment, which is a fancy way of saying memory changes don't affect function. And there's actually several different entities that all share different names and they all really share the same basic thing of memory changes without functional loss. So uh, in Europe, it's often called cognitive impairment, not dementia, which I find very awkward. Uh, I think MCI is a, actually a really nice, it's a, it's a nice acronym. Mild cognitive impairment flows off the tongue really well and it, that's always a good thing in an acronym. But it's basically memory test, uh, performance on memory testing or, or subjective complaints about memory, but no change in their ability to complete their activities of daily living. So um, there's, there's norms on a lot of the memory testing. And so if you're a certain age or a certain education level or both, you're, you're sort of expected to achieve a certain level on the testing, but there are plenty of folks who test lower than that 
and may or may not have concerns about their memory, but they're still driving and shopping and cooking and doing all the stuff that they would normally do. And they're not really getting a lot of support from families or need for extra help. So it's actually pretty common. Um, the, this, you'll see that those percentages are pretty wide, 10 to 20% is a big, a big range. But part of that is because of our diagnostic criteria. And it's hard to really pin it down because is it MCI, is it dementia, is one of those things that we, we all in working in the area wish we had better testing to really better differentiate. But it's probably about 10, 1 in 10 to 1 in 5 people over the age of 65. So all the way up to 90s and beyond. And a portion of those, if you follow them long enough, will progress to dementia. And it's about 50% after three years and in in about 5 to 20% per year. But there's also a flip side where uh, a good quarter of them per year will just revert back to normal testing. And so they, they don't even have MCI at that point. Um, a lot of them, it's an Alzheimer's type process, so an abnormal protein that's folding and, and causing inclusions in the brain, but it's not the same as Alzheimer's disease because that's a, that's a type of dementia that has specific diagnostic criteria. And a lot of people who have MCI will have vascular changes or what we used to call hardening of the arteries. They're little micro strokes that affect, can affect memory or processing, and that can contribute to the MCI. And, uh, and so you'll sometimes hear the, the phrase vascular cognitive impairment, which is really just mild cognitive impairment due to a vascular change. But the really important thing is that it, MCI is not early dementia. Early dementia is mild dementia, MCI is less impairing than mild dementia, and it's not the same entity. Some people will progress, and there's lots of work being done trying to figure out if can we identify who those 50% of people who progress to dementia are, are going to be, and is there something we can intervene earlier to either prevent that progression or to have a better outcome in the long run. But it's not the same thing, and being told that MCI is early dementia is, is sort of giving people a false idea of what it is they have to expect in the future. I just had a question. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about a memory palace as a form of memory recall? Ah, memory palace. So that's kind of outside of my, uh, my range, but I've, I've read about and I've, I've seen talks about memory palaces and they're fascinating. It's amazing what people can do with memory palaces. And for those of you who don't know, the memory palace is a, is a mnemonic trick of walk, walking through and imagining a virtual palace or, or any building or anything that works for you. And you associate particular memories with images that you generate yourself in that palace. And so if you're really good at it, there are people who can remember hundreds and hundreds of pieces of information and recall them like that by just zipping through their memory palace and going, okay, this is the room that's got the big pillar and the pillar represents my father who was born on the 14th of April. And for some reason they can, they can associate that. I'm sure there's more tricks to that. I don't do it myself and I don't know the, all the details, but it's a very, very effective memory trick for, for memorization of information. And it's very similar to what a lot of, what a lot of waiters and waitresses, when I used to work with that, I did that as well. You, you pick out a feature of the person and you associate that with their order. Um, I'm trying to think if I had a good example. I had one fellow who, who called me across the room after, uh, after I had given them their, their menus and he, he wanted to say, young man, I, I don't think I told you that I wanted horseradish with my, my steak. And I kind of looked at him as all the other three people started laughing. And I said, I'm sorry, you haven't ordered yet. But I didn't forget what his order was because he was the guy who forgot that he hadn't ordered the steak. And, and, and in fact, a month later when he came in, I knew what he wanted because I recognized him and remembered that. So, it's the same kind of trick. You're associating it with some abstract feature that works for you. And, and we'll actually talk about mnemonics in a bit too, because in medical school, we use a lot of mnemonics. So either using the first letters of a list in order to work, form a word or something like that. It works really well for some people. It doesn't work great for others, but yes, I've been, I've been amazed at what people can do with the memory palace approach. It's actually an interesting question. I wonder if that would be, have a role in, in dementia and teaching, teaching MCI or, or early dementia patients with, uh, 
mild dementia patients to use a memory palace trick and if that would help their function. I'll have to look that up. Okay, so when we talk about dementia, so we talked about mild cognitive impairment is memory changes without functional loss. So not unsurprisingly, dementia is memory changes with functional loss. So we talked about how you need to have a significant decline in one of those six cognitive domains, and then it interferes with your independence in some activities of daily living. So this is the, this is the, the umbrella term of dementia. So anything that's a memory problem that causes functional loss is a dementia, and then this, the different types fall underneath that umbrella. Now, when we're talking about um, severity of dementia, we often talk about different types of daily activities of daily living. So there's the instrumental activities of daily living. So those are the complex tasks that we learn in later life, um, usually later childhood, early adulthood. Um, some might argue that certain young, young men who went to school and then eventually um, medical school maybe didn't learn some like meal preparation very early on or ever mastered it, but we won't talk about that anymore. And, but things like shopping and meal preparation finances, that's that executive function, that really complex um, multi-stage things that we need to do in order to, to live in our complex daily world. Um, and then there's basic activities of daily living. So simpler tasks that you learn much earlier in life, so like how to get dressed, how to keep yourself clean, how to, what to do with food and how to eat it, how to get around and mobilize and how to transfer from a bed to a, the floor or from a chair to standing. Um, so we talked just a moment ago about mnemonics and, and one of the ones we use uh, that I learned here that works much better for the basic activities because I was trying to remind my my medical student yesterday when I was when I was practicing with her. Um, so shaft is the uh, S-H-A-F-T is the mnemonic for instrumental activities but you'll look and see that that doesn't really fit with what's up there and I could not remember what the H was and uh, some of them don't make sense but if you rearrange the basic activities instead it's dressing, eating, ambulation, transfers and hygiene that spells death. And if you if once you start losing all of your basic activities of daily living, you're getting pretty close to it. And that's one of the ways of remembering those packages. For me, because I do it all the time, it's it I've kind of lost and I, I've uh, well, I've forgotten the mnemonic that was supposed to help me remember it because I don't use it. And that's another example of of how memories function differently than memory than dementia because if you're not using it it disappears i have a lot of knowledge from medical school that's gone and i would have to go and, and retrieve it and dig it back up out of books because i don't use it on a daily basis so if we're talking about dementia overall so this is all dementias in that um, under that umbrella it affects about 10% of all the people over the age of 65 so if everyone from 65 to 105, um, which is a pretty big number. If you think about, you know, Canada and three, 30 million people, that's a lot of people. And, and the estimates right now are that about 25,000 uh, cases are diagnosed per year. There's about 500,000 with dementia right now, and it's probably going to double by 2030. And we're going to talk in just a minute about the baby boom and that implication. Um, there are some types that are more common in younger individuals, and there's some types of memory um, and most types of dementia get more common as we get older, but the types that are more common in younger individuals are very specific and thankfully a little bit less common. And it has significant impact on healthcare costs. So uh, I pulled this number from the Alzheimer's Society and it wasn't 100% clear to me when the number, when the study was actually done. And I don't think it represented last year's number, but it, it was fairly recent. But $12, $12 billion in Canada spent on you know, basically official and unofficial costs of managing and caring for dementia. So that's a, gonna grow. And the reason it's gonna, whoops, oh, sorry, hang on. Here we go, uh, there we go. The reason it's gonna grow is because of demographics. So lots of people have seen lots of this, uh, this is pulled from Statistics Canada. It's the number of live births per year in, uh, and the, with the numbers along the, the the side there, and you can see there's the great big 
baby boom right in the middle from 1946 to either 64 or 65, depending on which version of the baby boom um, meter. I think the, the folks who want it to be really scary cut it off here just where the peak goes and the folks who are being a little bit more strict cut it off at 65 where the peak's on its way down a little bit more. But regardless, that's, there's a lot of people there that are, that are aging and, and approaching 65. And in fact, when you break it down, these are the folks that are now 65. And uh, the graph should go off a little bit further. I saw a lady who was born in 1919 two weeks ago and um, and doesn't have too much cognitive impairment. And she's pretty spry, although uh, she's slowed down quite a bit, I'm sure. But you can see that there's still a lot of folks to come. And in the next 10 years, we've got the peak coming. And the reality is, is that our, our system will... I think this year COVID has really shown that our system is not prepared for this because COVID's put a strain on it that it wasn't prepared for. It's showing how things are crumbling around the edges and why we need to be investing a lot more money into appropriate levels of care and, and resources because otherwise we're dealing with a real problem coming down the road. And there's lots and lots of versions of this, this joke everywhere, but it's not a joke. You know, we're gonna we're gonna have a major crisis, and until I think until Queens Park and and uh, Parliament Hill start taking things a little more seriously and start really working at it, we're gonna we're really gonna struggle and we're gonna have major crises after major crises. So we're gonna talk about genetic risks and we're gonna do a poll. I'm hoping that everyone's comfortable with this. Um, but if you are comfortable sharing with us that what your family history with dementia is, uh, or your lack thereof, please do so, and we'll talk a little bit about their genetics. I feel like the little image that says hosts and panelists cannot vote is, is, is punitive. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's there to haunt us. <laughs> You're not allowed to influence your audience yeah. by voting. <laughs> In case you guys haven't noticed, this is my first time with Zoom polls. It's pretty cool and I'm enjoying it, but it's, I feel like I want to play with it all. Yeah, they're great. And lots of people are, are voting and so it's wonderful. Yeah. We're happy to see everybody participating. Yeah, and this, this one's also a multiple choice because it is quite possible to be both a, an identical twin and have other family members that have it. And uh, it's nice that we can have people select multiple ones if it's appropriate. Although hopefully they're not selecting one of the first five and the last one because that might make me wonder about them. <laughs> but it doesn't tell it doesn't tell us who selected what, so that's really? okay. You're yeah, safe if you if you have a little a little blip there. <laughs> It's also testing my ability to be comfortable with silence. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, so I'm, I'm kind of happy to see that there's no one in the first two categories because that's uh, anybody who's actually an identical twin of someone diagnosed with dementia is at enormously ele elevated risk and really should know about genetics of, fam of dementia already and have been tested. Um, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that there's, oh, I, actually, no, I'm not surprised that, that it's a low number for diagnosed before the age of 65, because it is much less common to be diagnosed before 65. Um, well, that's interesting. Why did I say Alzheimer's in that one question? Ah, yes, right. That's the reason. I will explain why I said Alzheimer's in some and dementia in others. So we'll get to that. I've almost fooled myself. And so about half of you don't have uh, any known family history and, and the other half have some family history. And that's that's actually pretty typical. Usually the number is about 40%, but there's lots of variation and, and there may be a little bit of self-selection if you if you have a, a family history and you uh, you may be a little, a little bit more comfortable working with and motivated to work with folks who have dementia as well. So, the big, the big thing with dementia we is... Go on, what we had just one yeah, question. Absolutely. Um, how does long-term use of alcohol increase risk for dementia? Aha, uh -huh. we're going to get to that. Okay. Hold, put a pin in that. We're going to get to alcohol. We're going to get to some other risk factors too, and alcohol is one of them, and we'll talk about that. So 
the 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 basics uh, answer to genetic risk and dementia is it's it depends. It, it's complicated. So there's lots of things that contribute. So there's genes that are involved, there's environment, there's uh, activities, there's personal choices like alcohol. Um, and family members often share risks. So you might share some dietary, dietary aspects, you might share a proclivity for activity or lack thereof, you might learn to learn some vices from your parents. Um, and the, this this can all have an impact and it's not those things that you learn from your family aren't inherited But they can kind of look like it uh, as I was preparing for this talk. I came across uh, a very interesting scenario There was a so in the South Pacific. There was a very specific disease called Kuru which comes from eating uh, eating the remains and specifically the brains of dead relatives and and it results in a neurodegenerative disorder which was initially assumed to be familial because only members of the family got it. But it was actually because you eat your own family members. And so if your family member has the Kuru prion in their brain, you eat it, you take it in, it affects your brain, you get sick. And it looks like it's this horrible genetic disease when it's actually all based on familial choices and, and cultural, cultural practices. So you can be fooled by what's genetic and what's not. Um, because of that complexity, there's really no genetic testing you can do for the majority of, of these complex dementias. But there is, you can sort of get a sense of the increased risk. So those of you who have the first degree relatives, that was the, the brothers, sisters, uh, mothers, fathers. Um, technically, sons and daughters are, are first degree relatives as well, but it's pretty uncommon for you to not have dementia and then your son and daughter develops it and then you develop it later, although it's not unknown, I did have a, a family like that. Um, but if you have a first degree relative with dementia and you're over the age of 55, um, it doubles your risk of developing dementia so from that 10% over age 65 to 20%. And that's actually a pretty big um, absolute increase in risk. But when we talk about genetics, it's still a fairly, a fairly low risk compared to something that was absolutely inherited, which peaks out at 50%. The other thing that complicates these complex inheritance patterns is it can easily skip generations because while you inherit, uh, inherit all these risk factors from say the parent that had, had dementia, you probably only get some of them, which means you're not guaranteed to have it. But if you get enough of them, you might get it. But you also might get not enough from one parent, but get some from another parent who doesn't have dementia, but has not enough risk factors to get it themselves, but can still pass them on. And so it can sometimes look like it skips generations and you're still passing along these risk factors, but there's just not enough of them in individual people. And as genes come in from other families, it can, it can modify those risks. We had one question. Yeah. Um, is there a cure for dementia? Uh, that, so there's not a cure for the common types of actual neurodegenerative dementia. We're going to talk about some other types of cognitive impairment that are reversible. So I guess technically curable, but no, for things like Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, the ones that we're going to talk about, they, they're, they're neurodegenerative disorders and you can slow them down, you can modify the risks, but there's nothing we can do to actually fix them once they start. Um, we can just improve quality of life. And Dr. Bradick and Dr. Weens are going to talk about that in future talks and some of the things that we can do to help treat it, but it'll be the same thing. We can't really fix it. So the reason that I, that I, I um, separated out onset of Alzheimer's disease before the age of 65 is this is the one exception to the complex inheritance pattern. There are actually specific genes, there's three of them that are, that are identified right now, that cause early onset Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's before the age of 65. And in these families, if the, you often see multiple people affected in each generation, and they often have a very similar age of onset. So if, if grandpa got dementia at 55, dad's probably going to get dementia at around 55 and you may get dementia around 55 if you inherited the gene. Um, so in these cases, genetic testing can be done because the genes are known and they're identified and there is actually benefit to it because you can identify, yes, I have it, no, I don't. Um, 
it was it translates into a much higher risk for close relatives. So when we go, if we go back to my my poll there, the the folks who would be an a twin of a patient with onset of Alzheimer's disease before 65 theoretically have a 100% chance, an identical twin has a 100% chance of also getting the disease because they are an identical twin, they inherited the abnormal gene as well. Now that's that's modified by the that phrase in the middle, high penetrance. So if you have the gene, you have a 95% chance of getting the illness, which is still really large, but it does mean you have a 5% chance of escaping it, probably because of influences from other genes that that are there, but that also means that identical twin doesn't really share any differences in the genes and, and their risk is pretty high. Um, the chance of inheriting it from a parent is 50-50. So you get one of each pair of chromosomes from your parent if, and one of them will have the abnorm abnormality. So you got a, it's a basically a coin flip. And then 95% chance of getting it if you catch the gene, which translates kind of into a 45% risk. But if you don't inherit the gene, if you if you get tested, you don't have the mutation, you don't have any increased risk, but that doesn't mean you have no risk because you still have the general risk that everyone else has from the other parts of that affect later onset Alzheimer's. I'm thinking there's a question there. Yes, there is a question. Yeah. Um, there was a question about, um, someone said that they see a lot of really educated people um, getting dementia. And if there is any, like doctors and lawyers, and if there was anything connected to a higher rate of dementia. Yeah, so in fact, high education is actually a protective factor against dementia. Um, you, what may be seen is that they stand out more. When you, when you see someone who's really highly educated function way, way up here, and now they're functioning way, way down here, that's really gonna stand out in everyone's memory and they're really gonna, they're really gonna be freaked out by it. I, I go up to Deep River and I, there's a lot of PhD uh, nuclear physicists up there who, who function way, way, way up here. I often joke with them that they should be scoring 40 out of 30 on the test instead of 30 out of 30 as a perfect score. And, and so A, people who know them well notice it a lot earlier and they still score great on the testing and they know something's wrong and their family knows something's wrong because they're not functioning at the same level. And then when they decline, often the test scores do not match what we'd expect from their function because they can kind of fool the tests because they're so well educated. But it really, it really, and, and for myself being, you know, being a physician and being a PhD and I, 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 I connect with these men and women who are such highly educated, such smart people and they're reduced to not being able to remember how to use a fork and it really really stands out so i suspect that's probably what they're seeing is they really those those people really stick out in their minds but there's actually it's actually quite a protective factor in having a, a when you start out the higher you start off the more protection you have and part of that is that your brain is used to storing and retrieving information and, and utilizing itself and our brains are a lot like our muscles if we don't use them they do atrophy over time but it's also part that they they probably learned a lot more compensatory tricks that help them make up the difference. That's very interesting. Thank you. And we just had one other question. Yeah. Um, is there a um, higher, sorry, I just lost it. Um, is there a higher risk of developing dementia uh, for someone who has Crohn's or an autoimmune disease that or a disorder that affects the gut health and um, inflammation response? Uh, yes, so we're gonna talk about that later too. But the, the, the short answer is yes. Infl inflammatory diseases do carry a bit higher risk because if you have an autoimmune attack in your gut, you can have autoimmune attacking other places. And most people who have one autoimmune disease will often have multiples. All right, so got another poll question. So which of the following is the most common type of dementia? And I got a whole bunch of them listed there, so. And so as people are answering, there was one question, is it possible to um, get dementia if it doesn't run in your family at all? Absolutely. So um, about 40% of dementia patients have another relative, uh, a first degree relative that have dementia, which also means that 
60% don't have another first degree relative. Now, some of them will have further away relatives, but it is actually quite common because as you can see from this list, and this isn't by any means an exhaustive list, there's lots of things that can cause dementia and there's lots of different mechanisms by which it happens, not all of which are inheritable. Thank you, that's great. Okay. All right, yeah, so the, the ones that everyone's heard about are always the top. So you guys as a group are right, Alzheimer's disease is the most common type. Uh, and followed closely by vascular dementia. And then it's kind of a toss up between frontotemporal and Lewy body. Um, and then the folks at the bottom who said dementia and multiple etiologies are also kind of right because it's actually most people who have Alzheimer's have some vascular component, but it's not a big enough one for us to call it mixed dementia. And about 50% of people with dementias have some vascular component that's an influencing factor. So it's, it's kind of a bit of all. I'm just gonna stick on this for a second because my medical student got really, really confused because she didn't recognize one of those diagnoses and she went looking it up. So I'm gonna just talk about Alzheimer's disease because it's a, it's a kind of a familial um, disorder that's caused by uh, difficulties pronouncing the letter Z. And, and so it, often people will inherit that because if the first person calls Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease, often lots of other members of the family will, will mispronounce it as well. And for some reason in the past three weeks, I've heard at least three families refer to Alzheimer's disease and, and, and it's closely related variant old timers disease. But um, I was quite pleased that I, I managed to fool my medical student into, into actually trying to look that one up. I think she, she's very keen. So I think the fact that she didn't recognize it freaked her out a little bit. Um, I didn't actually notice if anybody picked Alzheimer's disease. I don't think they did. I think that one was blank. I don't remember though. Anyway, that's not important. Um, so when we talk about types of dementia, it's really important to know that there's multiple causes of cognitive decline and not all of those are dementia. So the, a lot of the ones I listed were, were neurodegenerative dementias and the four we're gonna talk about is the, main, the, the, the big four that are vast majority of dementia are neurodegenerative diseases. So they, they affect the neurons of the brain and their steady progressive degeneration of the, of the underlying structure. But delirium is an acute illness that causes confusion and cognitive impairment, often reversible, often improves, but it's more of a medical acute emergency than a, than a long-term neurodegenerative process. There are a lot of drugs that can have imp negative impacts on memory and, and function, some of which is reversible and some of which isn't quite so reversible. And, and the person who asked about alcohol was on the right track in, in that sense, in the, in the partially reversible sense. And then lots of diseases can affect. So the, we, at, we had somebody ask about inflammatory diseases. Those are definitely in there, even though I don't list them. Infections are a common cause. Metabolic things like thyroid and B12, um, sleep disorders like sleep apnea, it's common, common after cardiac or, or strokes, uh, heart attacks and strokes. Um, any tumors, of course, anything that's growing in the brain that doesn't belong there, you could affect, uh, expect to affect cognition. And then a lot of psychiatric illness can actually affect it, depression being the big one, but m many of them can. Because if you're, if you're slowed down and you're sad and you're not focused, you're not going to remember very well. And, and many of you will notice that all of these start with D. And I, I often, I often kind of make fun of my general medicine colleague or general psychiatry colleagues for making fun of us as the as the uh, specialty that only treats diseases starting with the letter D. But they're actually not wrong, because the vast majority of what I deal with are dementia, depression, and delirium, and and sometimes I say defecation problems because everyone over the age of sixty five seems to be constipated. We had one more question. Absolutely. So, um, and it goes along with what you're saying. Um, someone was mentioning about the, the highly educated people. Mm -hmm. And is it possible that maybe um, they might be more vulnerable to dementia because of an increased exposure to stress at work? So that's, that's a really good point because stress and depression and anxiety all are risk factors for dementia in later life. The other thing that often happens and maybe a factor up in Deep River is exposures to toxins and exposures to chemicals. Um, my my father-in-law 
was a very, very smart man and often wondered if all of the years working in a chemistry lab without any kind of safety labels and safety gear and masks and respirators had had an effect on him and, and may have affected his memory, although he was still working at the point that he, he passed away and he was still a very smart man. I think he, we probably would have seen, had he, had he lasted longer, a little bit more difficulties just because of that damage. All right, so the four main types, we, we kind of alluded to this. So Alzheimer's being the most common, actually, I think my next slide, yes. So we'll just go on to this one. So you'll notice that the numbers, there's a lot of wide margin there. I, I tried putting error bars on this to show how wide the margin was, but it looked really wonky and weird. So the, the Alzheimer's disease has the biggest, widest margin. And the reason these are such wide margins is because we don't have great diagnostic um, tests. We can't test for Alzheimer's disease. There are certain types of specialized uh, SPECT and PECT PET scans that can identify amyloid proteins and maybe have a better chance of, of identifying Alzheimer's disease. But because there's, there's a lot of mixture, a lot of people who have Alzheimer's disease also have vascular changes and it's, it's hard to see the vascular changes without um, looking at uh, slices of brain on autopsy. Same with Lewy body, it's you know, staining the brain at autopsy to definitely diagnose it. And, and strangely, most families are not keen to have an autopsy done to diagnose their loved one's dementia. So it's not really a very useful test. And we end up going on clinical criteria that maybe are, are dependent and, and vary a bit by the, the, spe, the um, clinician who's diagnosing it. But overall, it, Alzheimer's and vascular in most areas are looking at uh, being the two most common. We used to think Lewy body was very, very uncommon. And there's actually become, in the last probably 10 or 15 years, at least since I've been doing my training, we're seeing more and more of the diagnosis and more awareness of it. And I think a lot of Lewy body was either previously misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease or as Parkinson's related dementia. And, and the actual dementia of Lewy body was, was missed a lot. And that attributes or contributes to a lot of that uh, higher frequency. So we're going to do was, another poll. There was one more oh, question. Absolutely. Go back. Yep. The question was about learning disabilities and yes. do learning disabilities increase the chance of developing dementia? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. It, it would certainly di complicate diagnosis because we do, so there's a complex, there's a complex answer to that that's coming to mind. So the learning disabilities per se, I don't, I, I can't give you a good answer on that. I'd have to go looking at, at that. The, it would somewhat complicate matters, especially when we're looking at testing, because of course, if someone has a specific learning disability like dyslexia, where they have specific troubles with certain types of tasks, they would always struggle with that on, on the testing. And so they might look more impaired on testing, but if they're still functioning in the middle of it, through their daily lives, it wouldn't have so much of an impact or, or the effect on the diagnosis of dementia for them. But I don't know if, if having a, a learning disability increases your risk of developing a dementia. There is a really interesting specific issue with folks who have Down syndrome, because Down syndrome is, is a extra copy of chromosome 21. Now, when we talked about genetics, one of those three genes is located on chromosome 21. So folks who have down syndrome have an extra copy of that specific Alzheimer's disease gene. And folks with Down syndrome have a very high incidence of developing early onset Alzheimer's disease because of that association between chromosome 21 and the Alzheimer, one of the Alzheimer's disease genes. So, and then I often, I do often get folks who are in um, either dual diagnosis programs or they're in, um, I'm blanking on the term. See, that's the that's the uh, the the free recall uh, deficit as you get older. So, folks who are in special needs or or I cannot think of the word I want, but um, with it, some intellectual impairment, we often do get asked, "Are they getting dementia?" And it's really very difficult to identify and and say for sure because none of the testing works for them because it it needs to be testing that's that's 
taking into account their specific disabilities and where they usually function at. And often we're relying on the folks who know them really well. So if they're part of a program or if they're in a group home or they, they have um, family members who know them really well and can give us an idea, we can sometimes get a good idea. Are they functioning lower than when they used to be? And that can tell us. But I don't, I don't know off the top of my head if, if they're at higher risk or if they're at the same risk and, and we, we see them uh, develop dementia like everyone else. I, I just wanted to mention as well, Gord, we're at, uh, to give you the 25-minute warning. Okay. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to speed it up and be less wordy, I think. It, well, if we, right. go, if we go over a bit and people aren't able to keep watching it live, they can check out the recording sure. as well. So while, while we're doing this poll, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll talk about my, my deep dive into aluminum versus aluminium. So I was super curious because I've always wondered why the British say it wrong. And um, so I discovered, what I discovered was that a chemist in the 1820s had originally named a whole bunch of elements, including what turned out to eventually become aluminum, but he called it alumium and using the IUM at the end, just like potassium and lithium, I believe, were the other two that he named. And a year later, when he published more papers, he had switched to using aluminum. Now, he was an American, American scientist, and that became the standard in America. But the British uh, chemists preferred the consistency of using EM at the end, and so they continue using aluminum. Alumi, alumi, oh aluminium and uh, because it's like lithium and promethium and everything else that ends in em all right so lots of people thinking it's true lots of people th thinking it's false so it's actually false uh there isn't it isn't actually a risk factor but we did once think it was and my understanding of the reason for that is that when we first identified the inclusion bodies that are a characteristic feature of Alzheimer's disease, they contained aluminum in higher concentrations than is normal in the body. And so one of the assumptions was is that aluminum was one of the causative agents, but it actually turns out that that's likely just an artifact of how these inclusion bodies form. So aluminum pots is not a risk factor. Aluminum cans is not a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. So it's oh, the most I'm common type of- that. Sorry, just one question, Gordon. Yeah. So there's a question about- food preservatives. And um, there was a question, in countries that don't use preservatives, dementia is less common. Is that true? Uh, no, dementia is actually equally common across the world. And there's lots of, there's lots of little myths like that. So the one place that is different is in places that have high uh, intake of high omega-3 fatty acids, so fish eating countries, do tend to have a slightly decreased risk of certain types of dementia like Alzheimer's disease. Um, the, the, one of the, one of the common, one of the common myths that's out there that it sometimes uh, causes people to spend a lot of money is there's a book about coconut oil and that, that all, that us, the claim they make is that Australia has a much lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease because they eat a lot of coconuts. In fact, all, Australia is one of the centers of research for Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia in general. They have some amazing research projects down there and research centers. And dementia is just as common in, in uh, Australia as it is elsewhere in the world. And there's actually really no evidence that coconut oil has any impact on Alzheimer's disease. And the person who publishes the book that makes these claims also runs a company that sells coconut oil. So there's some there's some concerns there um oh, so going back to this uh, most common type of dementia uh, about 50 to 80 percent that's what the graph said it primarily affects people over 65 and does grow com more common with older age so the the number that we usually throw around in in the field is that it's a one percent risk of having alzheimer's disease at the age of 65 and then every five years that risk doubles so two percent uh, 5%, 10%. Um, it gets up, the, the numbers break down a little bit and it gets up to 85%, uh, sorry, 25 to 30% at 85 years of age. And overall, if you look at all the people over the age of 65, 5% of them have Alzheimer's disease. And if you take that 10% of people over, over 
65 have dementia and 5% have Alzheimer's disease, that fits better with the 50% of all the cases of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. But again, keep in mind these numbers are, have a lot of wiggle room. So that early onset of under 65 is fairly rare. So about 5% of Alzheimer's cases happen under the age of 65. And I found this really interesting number of one in 4,000 at the age of 50. So that's the early onset Alzheimer's, about one in 4,000 have, uh, have dementia. I tried looking up um, what the youngest case was, and I found a couple of interesting cases. There's the, the youngest actual meets criteria diagnosed uh, Alzheimer's disease was age, I believe it was 24. Yeah, 24 years of age. Um, but there were two two cases that I also found that were Alzheimer's-like syndromes that weren't true Alzheimer's in a two-year-old and a six-year-old. So essentially dementia in a two-year-old and a six-year-old. And it must have been a, a, a very challenging task to try to diagnose that because, of course, if you haven't learned things yet because you're not old enough, how do you measure that they've unlearned them? Uh, as if I'm recalling correctly, and this is information I got a long time ago when I was in a resident, but the youngest case that I'm aware of at the Royal was in their early 30s and uh, as a young man. So pretty, pretty tragic when you think about it. So going back to those um, cognitive, cognitive um, domains, learning and memory is what's primarily affected in Alzheimer's disease. So what that means is they, they can't learn the information to store it, and then so they can't retrieve it. And so often what you see is that they have very poor insight into their memory problems because they basically forget that they forget stuff. So they think they're remembering because they don't remember what they forgot. Um, queuing and reminders don't help much because if you don't store it, you can't retrieve it. And Often you'll see progressive decline in the other cognitive domains, but it's always the learning and memory that's the most prominently affected. Now, in terms of uh, prognosis, the average from onset of symptoms to death is seven to 10 years. But I often say to families, because people vary a lot in how quickly they, they progress, because we're all individuals and we all have other risk factors that affect how we progress. So I often say to families, it's like it's eight years plus or minus nine, because I've had folks who go really, really quickly. And I have folks who don't really change a lot over the course of decades. And you can question whether they're diagnoses, because of course, we're not going to chop their brain up and find out where they're going slower. Um, so what the basic underlying problem is these abnormal protein deposits. So the second line there, the amyloid plaques are actually what was first identified, but they're actually a later finding. There's certain types of abnormally, clumps of abnormally folded proteins called neurofibrillary tangles, which are found at the start of the cognitive decline. But basically what they both do is they, they damage the, the cells and they cause them to die. And then what's left behind has to make up the difference. And it, it largely affects cholinergic neurons, and cho acetylcholine is one of the major neurotransmitters important for learning and memory. And so you get depletion of that neurotransmitter, and that's part of why when you, when you hear the talk about treatments, that a lot of the treatments, well, really three of the four treatments that we have are focused on acetylcholine and, and kind of boost, giving it a boost. So imaging, is kind of helpful, but kind of not helpful. So sometimes they'll show atrophy, and and I would lose my certification as a geriatric psychiatrist if I didn't show this picture, because every geriatric psychiatrist shows this every time they talk about atrophy. But this is not what we mean by atrophy of the brain in, in Alzheimer's disease. It actually looks more like this. So you can see that in this nice full brain, there's a little bit of spaces here in the ventricles, and there's the little the little creases in the brain, but everything's kind of full and, and, and meaty looking. Whereas in the Alzheimer's brain, and this is very advanced Alzheimer's, you can see these gaps are much bigger and then the, these ventricles are, are huge and, the, and just the, the tissue of the brain is much more shrunken. It's not, this is not really a diagnostically useful tool because at this point of, of atrophy, the person would be so advanced and have so much impairment that the diagnosis wouldn't be in question at all. And folks who have mild impairments and you're wondering, is it Alzheimer's, is it vascular, is it something else? A test, you, you might get the be at best get mild age-related atrophy is the quote from the neurologist.
So then when we, we talk about staging, so the Alzheimer's Society has a really interesting seven point staging, which is really useful for, for correlating function with, with severity. And a lot of families find that really helpful. From a clinical perspective, we tend to just use mild, moderate, and severe. So in, in mild Alzheimer's dementia, you'll get some forgetfulness and repetitive stories and questions. They'll lose some of those instrumental activities of daily living, so those complex ones and they have an increased risk of depression. And part of that is the changes that are happening in the brain, putting them at more risk, but also they're often much more frustrated. They don't understand what's going on. They don't know why they're having troubles. And so they get uh, much higher rates of depression. Um, moderate, you start to get much more marked memory loss. And this is where you start having problems with those basic ADLs, the, the dressing and the washing and the, the eating. And this is where we tend to see the, a lot of the behavioral problems. So they're, they're functional enough to know what they want to do, but maybe not functional enough to accomplish what they want. So they get easily frustrated, they get upset, they might go looking for things they think they remember. Sleep-wake disruptions are really common. And then memory-related delusions. And the, the sort of classic one is people are stealing stuff, so I'm going to hide it, but then I forget where, it's, where I hid it. So I can't find it. So someone must have stolen it. So I better hide it. And, and you get this vicious cycle and families can get really good at finding stuff because they're just constantly searching for things that have been hidden. Um, and then in severe, you're, you're losing basic, all the basic ADLs and some of the basic functions like speech and continence and then agitation and aggression become more common because they often don't have the functional ability to have some of the, the more sophisticated behavioral problems. So there's a few Alzheimer's variants. So classic Alzheimer's is the learning and memory. There's a really interesting entity called logopenic primary progressive aphasia, where basically people uh, have expressive aphasia and they can't, they can't think of words. So they'll talk around a word. So they'll talk about uh, using the device with a long wooden stick and metal tines that is used to gather the fall falling div items from the trees in the autumn and they're talking about a rake but they can't think of the word rake and they can't think of a few of the other words and so they talk around it and you can figure out what they're saying but they can't express it it's actually an alzheimer's type it's not you'll we'll talk a little bit about frontotemporal types and there's there's a very similar thing in frontotemporal dementia um, similarly with social cognition, there is a, a, a social cognition, a behavioral variant of Alzheimer's disease that looks very much like behavioral variant front of temporal dementia and can be a real challenge to sort out. And then with the perceptual motor, the posterior cortical atrophy is, is atrophy of the back part of the brain and in, in where the vision cortex is. And so they often have vision problems, they have some slowing of their motor functions, and they, and they have uh, what's called a idiomotor apraxia. So they can't figure out how to do stuff, even though they could describe it to you, they can't physically do it. All right, so we're gonna do a little, a little test here. This one's actually, uh, which, which one of these symptoms, wait a minute, which of these, yes, which one of these features is most consistent with moderate Alzheimer's disease in a 76 year old lady with a three year history of memory problems? And I'll, I'll, I'll throw my student under the bus. She had troubles with this one. My medical student had troubles. Now, to be fair, she wants to be a neurologist, which, um, and she's only third year. So she hasn't had a lot of exposure yet. So hopefully, and as she goes along, she'll, uh, she'll have been able to get this one. Yeah, that's a tough question. Yeah, and, and there's little tricks to it. And that's, uh, that's why I will, we'll talk about what it means. All right. Yeah, so most of the people got the right one. So it, it's the repetitive story, uh, telling the same story over and over again because her memory. So in order to be moderate, she wouldn't be able to, to do her shopping and cooking. Those are those, are those high-level functions. And, and you might still have some of them in mild, but you'll have lost those by, by um, moderate. And then 
we'll talk just a minute about vascular dementia. So major stroke would be, would be much more in keeping with vascular dementia. Although I'll note that three years ago is before the stroke. So you have to do a little bit of massaging and, and understanding what vascular dementia really means in order to put those two together. And then seeing bugs in, on the floor of our apartment is often something that we see in a delirium or, uh, or maybe Lewy body dementia. So we'll get to those in a moment too. So this one's gonna be quick. Vascular dementia is basically Alzheimer's disease. Uh, well, that's kind of misleading you. So it's kind of like Alzheimer's disease, but caused by strokes. So you have to have memory changes and functional loss that's attributed to strokes or vascular change. So you have to meet that criteria for dementia, the one cognitive domain plus that's impaired plus the functional loss. And you have to have sufficient vascular damage to account for changes, which can mean a big stroke where you have real clear symptoms, or it might mean a whole bunch of little teeny tiny strokes that individually don't cause uh, symptoms, but accumulate to cause the memory changes. And there needs to be either a temporal relationship between the vascular damage, so you had the stroke and then you had the memory changes, or you have to have prominent decline in complex attention, processing speed, and executive function. And those are the, the key features of vascular dementia because those little tiny strokes often affect the high speed connections in our brain that let us do that complex attention and processing speed and executive functions in our frontal lobes, which is the biggest part of our brain and therefore a little bit more vulnerable to the vascular changes. So it's the second most common cause. Um, that's a big range and that's a largely because some studies will, will lump mixed dementia as a different type along with Alzheimer's. Whereas um, if, you, if you use strict criteria, you may get a, a larger number. Um, about a quarter of people who have a great big stroke and are hospitalized for it will develop dementia in the, within the first three months. So it is pretty common with a big stroke, but actually most vascular dementias are caused by what we call microvascular changes or small vessel changes. What years ago we called hardening of the arteries. So it's clogging of the arteries, just like in the heart, but it's happening in the brain. There was a really good question I wanted yeah. to ask. Um, what does a person f with dementia feel or think in each of the different phases? So the mild, moderate, severe, yeah. are they comfortable or is there a way to make them comfortable? That's, that's a really good question. And, and kind of, that's sort of a large part of what we do on a daily basis in, in diagnosing and helping, helping facilities or, or homes or families manage it. Often what happens with, with true Alzheimer's disease, because they don't remember that they forget, they're often very happy and, and fine and think they're doing great and they're, they're chugging along perfectly happy as long as they have enough supports that are subtle enough that it doesn't offend their sensibilities that you're helping out too much. So it can often be really challenging for the families because you've got this person that you're trying to help and they don't think they need help and you're trying to find clever ways to get them help and keep them, keep them feeling independent. So they, they sometimes are the happy, happily demented folks. But a lot of times they're also frustrated because my daughter's interfering with me. She keeps telling me that I can't do stuff and I know I can even though really she can't. Um, often in the very late stages, they're very unaware. And so kind of what you, I often tell the story of the first lady I ever met with dementia as a resident. She was 80 years old and she was on the psych unit at the Civic. And when I first met her, she told me about how she'd just come back from the fishing hole with her grandpa and they had a wonderful day in the sun. And she could tell me that she was 80 years old. She knew that she was in the hospital and she knew that her memory wasn't so great. But the story with her grandpa was real. It happened today and she was really happy about it. And I, th I remember think thinking, if I get dementia, that's how I want to be. Reliving happy old memories with lots of people looking after me and being happy about it. So there are lots of folks like that and there's lots that really struggle. And it's often so individualized that you can't really say one way or the other. And it's about finding, finding what works for the person and meeting them where they are instead of trying to make them fit into, into your schedule or your, your mold of what they need to be doing. And that's really one of the big challenges for, especially for facilities, is how do you get folks an individualized care plan in a great big facility that has rules and, and routines and regulations and everything else. Um, so, Vascular dementia, because, because it's these little strokes, the strokes can happen at different rates in different areas. And so if you have lots of stuff in the frontal lobes, then you might have a lot more difficulties with your executive function or your language or 
disinhibition and irritability because that's where our, our mood control centers are. Um, but if you have more in the back, you might have more vision impairments or you might have more difficulties getting things to work because you can't, you, your muscle memory can't tell you how to do it. So it, it often gives you different sets of symptoms in different people, but it also can vary from day to day because our brains, while we, it can't fix the damage, it can sometimes route around the damage. And the, the analogy I use for folks is here in Ottawa, we've got the Queensway. And so you got your high speed connection. You get from Canada to Orleans in a couple of minutes if the traffic's good, if the traffic's good and you're you're doing it on a Sunday morning. But if there's an accident or if there's construction that takes out the Queensway, kind of like what a stroke does, you can still get there, but you have to take the back roads. It's gonna definitely take you longer, and that's that processing speed. Um, you might not get there because you get lost. You might get frustrated. You might end up being late and it doesn't matter anymore. And so you give up. And that's what happens with vascular dementia. Sometimes the connections fire and sometimes they don't. And so families often say, well, he remembered that yesterday and he can't remember it today. I don't understand. And that, that's a very common feature with vascular dementia. It often has less impact on learning and memory because what happens with vascular dementia is our learning and memory, our, our memory circuits are very widely distributed. So Alzheimer's damages them because it damages the whole brain at once. But the vascular damage is more spotty and so it, it's harder for it to hit all the learning and memory. So often these people can store the memory and it's there and if they have the right cue they can retrieve it, but they often need a lot of help to get that out of there. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, again, that Queensway problem. Um, Lots of times they're more aware of the deficits because they can learn stuff, they can learn that they forget things and they're often really frustrated by it, which means they're also at higher risk of depression and anxiety the, because of where the strokes happen, they can have more emotional ability or apathy. And so a lot of times we're often treating emotion, um, psychiatric illnesses in, in vascular dementia because they're at higher risk, both from the strokes themselves, which put them at higher risk, but also from the frustration of understanding that I can't function and I should be able to excuse me, and being hard on themselves. Um, genetic risk is a lot like that multifactorial thing we talked about with um, Alzheimer's, but it's, it's really parallels the risk of having strokes, because if the illness is caused by strokes, your risk of having strokes is, is there. And that's, that's part of where the question about the alcohol fits in. So alcohol is a risk factor for stroke. Uh, it's also a risk factor for damaging the brain in, in other types of dementia that we'll get to. And there's so many multiple factors and there's a really strong environmental and behavioral effects. So smoking is one of the biggest fat risk factors for vascular dementia because it's one of the biggest risk factors for strokes and heart disease. And so there's a lot of things that people can modify to reduce their risk factors, but one of the risk, several of the risk factors you can't modify like what your gender is and how old you are and what your family history is. And so it's, there's limits to what we can, what we can help with on this. All right, so we're going to move on to frontotemporal dementia, and I, this, one's, this one's more of a tongue-in-cheek fun one, but um, it's interesting. I don't know if there were any Star Trek fans in the, who read my intro and, wondering, and, and my uh, wondering about is temporal, uh, temporal dementia related to time travel. <laughs> I just wanted to say as the uh, poll is going here that uh, we were scheduled to end at 8.30, Hmm. But uh, we're going to go a bit overtime if that's all right with you, uh, Dr. Dahl. Oh, it's completely fine with me. Once I get talking, I can keep going. <laughs> we'll try and end it maybe in like 15 minutes or half an hour or so. Okay. Um, but if you're not able to keep watching uh, tonight, I'm going to send out a recording of the session out to you all over email so you can watch it at a later date. All right. Oh, some people are hopeful. <laughs> so it is, it is in fact not true. Um, front, front of temporal dementia refers, refers to the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. Um, but you're not completely off base because one of the key things and, and one of the recurring jokes you'll see is that a lot of folks with front of temporal dementia are actually regressing in, in age and time and they often behave very much like, like teenagers. They, the frontal lobes are the last part of the brain to develop and it develops somewhere in the early 20s, a little bit earlier in women than men probably. And 
And so a lot of the features of front and temporal dementia that we're going to talk about might seem really familiar to those of you who have teenagers, especially teenage boys at home. So FTD is, a, is an umbrella, a sub umbrella term for a couple of different presentations. So you can either have progressive behavioral changes and executive deficits, which is, is creatively um, named behavioral variant FTD, or you can have selective and prominent language difficulties, which is cleverly named language variant FTD. And as a group, they have a much earlier age of onset. So the, the range in the literature is 21 to 85, which is an enormous range and, and very low down there again on the, in the younger folks. And it peaks around 55 years with a, with a, a 10 year range on either side. Um, it consists of about 5% of those folks who are referred for cognitive assessment. The majority of them, of course, being Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. But if you break them down to under 60, under 70 and over 70, there's a much bigger proportion of frontotemporal dementia in the under 70 group than the over 70 group. And in fact, under 70, it's the second most common type of dementia, still second to Alzheimer's disease, but um, becomes much more common with the other types being more common in the older ones. So it's primarily a decline in, in what we call the frontal functions. So our frontal lobes are really what makes us human. It dif differentiates us from the other animals because they have either no li very limited or much smaller frontal lobes. And it's where we have our social cognition, our ability to, to interact uh, with the nonverbal, where we have our executive abilities. It's also where we have our filters. So when those break down, we get a lot of disinhibition, blurting out things, saying stuff, sexual behaviors. And it's also our starter motor is in there. So when the starter motor fails, then they, they get bump on the log syndrome where they, there's not a lot of get up and go and get started. Um, empathy and our ability to love and, and be affectionate is in there. Um, sometimes compulsive or repetitive behavior. So there's circuits that let us lift the needle out of the groove and move it to a different groove. And if they start to fail, you get people who just do the same thing over and over and over again. They can't stop themselves. And then language is a big part of it, especially the temporal lobes. So I don't have an image to show. Um, I mean, Homer, Homer's frontal and temporal lobes are also small in that picture, but that's not uh, all that useful. There is a classic picture that shows only the frontal lobes shrunk and the, 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 the lobes in the back of the brain, the parietal and the occipital are nice and big and meaty, but I wasn't able to track that down from the textbook that it's, I, I remember seeing it in. Again, that, that function of remembering when you learn something that deteriorates as you get older. Um, the behavioral variant is the one that usually causes the most uh, disruption for, for uh, uh, folks with FTD. So it's usually damage to the frontal lobes, either the right lobe or both lobes. It's a half of all FTD and it runs in families in about a third of cases. So it's pretty inheritable. We don't really, it's again multifactorial, so we don't have specific uh, genes, although some of the, there are some specific protein genes that have been identified as abnormal uh, in some cases. The classic frontal symptoms are the ones we just talked about. So the disinhibition, apathy, loss of empathy, the perseverative behavior. Hyperorality can be a real problem. It's, it's like when babies explore the world with their mouths, but if you don't have a parent following around keeping, keeping the dangerous stuff out of the mouth, it can really cause a lot of problems. Um, loss of social graces, so blurting things out, saying rude stuff, being angry, being very self-centered. Um, impulsivity and poor planning are also quite common. And many of you who've um, had gone through teenage years will probably recognize some of those symptoms as belonging to some teenagers at times. Um, of course, the teenagers hopefully grow out of it. This, it continues to progress. FTD tends to have a relative sparing of cognitive domains, some of the cognitive domains. So learning and memory, especially early on, is very intact. Their memory is actually not too bad. And perceptual motors, their ability to do, to do uh, visual and motor tasks, so things like driving is often fairly good in the in the interim, but things like impulsivity and poor planning aren't so great when you're driving too, so there are concerns. In, uh, in mild behavioral variants, so one of the early things is loss of empathy and affection, so spouses will often notice it first and then struggle to have other people understand what they're worried about, and I've met with a number of uh, mostly women that have struggled for years trying to find somebody to help their husbands because they know something's wrong and they aren't taken seriously. 
and it's often often our teams that come along and go, yes, there is something wrong. This is what it is, and it all fits for them. Um, by the time, uh, so they'll have difficulty with some of the really complex tasks like managing their finances or managing their correspondence, but they're generally pretty functional. They just have some differences in their behaviors. Moderate tends to start to have more problems. So the sweet tooth one uh, can cause problems. They, they start to focus on, on the dopamine stimulating reward center type things like candies or chips. Um, they can become uncooperative. They have a lot worse problems with keeping track of time and when they're gonna be late or not. They might limit their food choices, change their clothing choices, and so then start to have trouble operating devices or need prompting to get something done. And then by severe, um, often the, a lot of the severe dementias start to look very much alike. And so you'll, you'll get the loss of manners and loss of initiation, which is very specific to behavioral variant but it happens in other types and then progressing on to really losing very basic functions. The language variants are, they're equally common, but we don't see them very much because they don't really uh, run into behavioral problems and it's much more about their, their language function loss and it's less inheritable, less than 10% of cases in families. And they tend to have this prominent language loss, but it spares learning motor and perceptual, uh, sorry, learning memory and perceptual motor and then they have less evidence of those frontal symptoms, the disinhibition and impulsivity that I, I talked about with the behavioral variant. Um, semantic variant is damage to the front part of the temporal lobe, often on the left, because most of us have our language centers on the left. And they, they can repeat words and they can generate normal grammar and fluency, but then they look a lot like that logopenic person who talked about the, the long handled device with the tines that, that uh, collects the, the leaves. Whereas the non-fluent variant, which is damaged to the, the more posterior part of the, the part closer to the, the back of the brain, it they have hard halting speech. They can't produce good fluid speech. They often make sound errors and mispronunciations, and their communication is much, much more impaired, and, and they struggle a lot more with their communication overall. So front of temporal dementia is often misdiagnosed. We talked about the the, the Spouses often are looking for help, but they get identified as psychiatric disorders quite commonly. Personality disorders especially are, are dismissed as bad behavior, but they're often, once they start to affect memory, they'll get diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease or another type, and, and it's not uncommon for them to be diagnosed as some other neurological condition until it becomes more apparent. The, the neurotransmitters are interesting because it doesn't affect the cholinergic system, the memory system, nearly as much it affects the serotonin system because a lot of those frontal lobe circuits are serotonin and there's, there's a lot of dopamine in those deep structures that are in the frontal lobes. And so we often, and you'll, you may see this in some of the other talks, we're often using serotonin-based medicines to try to treat these symptoms. All right, so this is my, the first of my, my anti-teenager uh, <laughs> uh, polls that my daughter became very, very offended by. <laughs> And I, I discovered with, with my medical student, this is also a little bit of a challenging one. It doesn't immediately jump out which one's the correct one. And I think it's because you're juggling what a teenager might be like and, and what an FDD patient, based on what I said, might be like. All right, I guess I'll end the poll there. All right, so what do we got? Share the results. Yes, yeah, so most people got it right. There's it, the word finding difficulties and word substitutions would be the, the, the behavioral or the language variant, which is very different from a teenager. The other ones are very common um, uh, FTD patients and whether you've seen, whether you think of them as common in, in teenagers or not is, is much more a, a uh, um, a matter of, of experience and opinion. So the last one we're gonna talk about is Lewy body dementia, which is actually two, it's an umbrella term for two related syndromes. There's dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia, and they're very similar and they're both defined by these Lewy bodies in the brain. And depending on where they happen, gives a bit of a different picture. So 
in in DLB, they're present in in across many of the cortical structures, so the main thinking part of the brain. And in in Parkinson's disease dementia, they're more present in those deep brain structures. Excuse me, deep brain structures. And so, for those who are at all interested, this is what a Lewy body looks like. Although I have to admit that had you taken this picture and not put arrows on it, I don't know that I would have been able to pick out which ones are Lewy bodies. So as I said, we, we think they're, they're more common than we once thought, and they're probably around about 10% of dementia, give, it, give or take a bit. And dementia with Lewy body, so that's the type that's not Parkinson's disease dementia, presents as a mix of Alzheimer's type symptoms and Parkinson's disease. So they have prominent deficits in learning and memory, just like the Alzheimer's disease patients, but they tend to have more problems with complex attention, which is a lot more like the Parkinson's uh, disease dementias. Um, they have symptoms like Parkinson's, so the tremor or the rigidity or the shuffling gait and the falls, and falls are very prominent. But the, the key diagnostic feature is the timing of the Parkinson's versus the dementia. So they, in, in DLB, they have to, the dementia either starts first and then they get Parkinson's, or the Parkinson's start and then they immediately get dementia uh, within a year. So when we talk about diagnosis, it's, it's a little bit um, in, imprecise because, again, like, uh, like some of the other dementias, we can only really 100% diagnosis when we cut the brain open, stain it, and look for the Lewy bodies. Um, but we do probable or possible. So probable is the, this is what we're really dealing with and we're fairly sure of it. And possible is, well, it could be, but I'm not 100% sure. And it comes down to the core symptoms. So DLB patients have this variable level of confusion that often looks like delirium. And it takes a bit of work really sometimes to figure out, okay, they're not delirious. There's not a cause of something medical. This is the way they usually are. Visual hallucinations are very prominent and they're almost exclusively visual. So they don't tend to hear voices or noises. They don't tend to feel or hear or um, feel things or smell things or taste things that are abnormal. It's almost always visual hallucinations and usually not so scary stuff. It's people, animals, um, and, and sometimes they're not very distressed by it at all. Parkinson's symptoms are a key feature, so the, the tremor and the rigidity. And then there's some supportive symptoms. So a lot of people with Parkinson's will have uh, REM behavior disorder or acting out their dreams, and that's a, a, a common feature in DLB. Frequent falls is, a, is another common one, and DLB patients are really sensitive to antipsychotic medication, so doses that the average person could tolerate with maybe minor symptoms can be a disaster with DLB patients. So to have probable, you need the dementia, the whole functional impairment part, and either two of the core or one of the core and one of the supportive. So that's that's a little bit tighter um, criteria. Possible DLB is really any any of the symptoms plus the dementia. So it's a little bit more loosey goosey, and there are a lot of folks with possible DLB that end up not being really DLB. Um, so Parkinson's is kind of the flip story. They develop Parkinson's for at least a year before they get dementia. So it's primarily the Parkinson's disease, and then they have some dementia afterwards. And if you look at all Parkinson's patients, within the 10 years from their diagnosis, about half of them will develop some, some cognitive impairment that qualifies for dementia. They have a slightly different uh, pattern of dysfunction. So they often have more executive functions early on, more perceptual motor functions early on, but they have less of the learning and memory, which means they're often much more aware of their deficits and they struggle with the, the daily functions pretty quickly. Um, generally language is pretty good and they often have very slow processing speed and memory retrieval so they can sometimes get the right answer but you have to give them a lot more time to get there because it's going to take them a while to find the answer and if you if you ask the question again because they're taking too long then you start the whole process over and they'll often get frustrated with you because they they can't get to get it processed all right I actually, I wonder if, yeah, we can do this one. I think we're, we're getting close to the end and then um, folks can jump out instead of the, uh, the last few questions, which are our poll questions. Okay, sounds good. So in somebody who, which of the following symptoms is not likely to be seen in a patient with dementia with Lewy body? So that's that first one that has dementia first, then Parkinsonism. And they have the, 
they have the uh, the possible and probable with the with the criteria, the core and core and uh, secondary symptoms, supportive symptoms. Yeah, this is a bit of a tough question. I see the answers are uh, are quite split so far. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Sure, uh, my medical student had trouble with this one. This one too. So not so not likely. It's actually the first one. So hearing the voice narrating the actions. So remember that I said they're visual hallucinations primarily. Hearing a voice narrating actions is actually really common for schizophrenia, but it's really uncommon in any type of dementia. Um, forgetting how to use the telephone would be one of those things that's that's tip, that you'd kind of you'd expect to see in someone with dementia because they're losing a functional ability. And the screaming and thrashing at night is actually that that acting out the dreams, so the, the REM behavior disorder. So yeah, it, that is a tough one. I think I made that one too tough. Uh, it'll be a good one for the residents. They should, they should be able to get that. If they don't get that, they're in trouble. So with other causes of dementia, um, there's lots of different topics. And we kind of covered some of the topics, so I'm gonna quickly run through these. The neurological conditions, um, so Huntington's disease has a specific type of cognitive impairment that's a lot like the behavioral variant uh, where they have some apathy, they have some loss of social, social um, cognition, um, some, sometimes some impulsiveness. Progressive supranuclear palsy is a really interesting one where they, it's a Parkinson's-like syndrome that has confusion and they have a really specific eye palsy so they can't look up they can look down but they can't look up and so it actually leads to some interesting uh, problems because they often walk around like this and so they fall over backwards a lot because they're always tilting their head back and I've actually had a few people who've had problems because they they feel like the pe person's intimidating because they're standing really close but it was actually a tall man who's trying to look them in the eye, but he can't look, lift his eyes up to look across, so he's standing over them so he can look down on them. And, but it was being interpreted as, as, as intimidating when he was just trying to make eye contact. So he, sometimes you have to filter your thoughts about what the intent is based on what the, the illness is. Cortical basal, de, cortical basal degeneration is an uncommon, very Alzheimer's-like um, function that has some slowing uh, and some visual impairments. High, normal pressure hydrocephalus is uh, basically water on the brain. So there's too much water, the ventricles are, are expanded and and it comes with the, and, and so the, the structures, the lower structures are being pressed on and they, they have a, a classic combination of confusion, urinary uh, incontinence and a wide-based gait and falls. So it's, uh, and it can be seen very easily on a, on a CT scan. Uh, traumatic brain injury, of course, our brains do not do well with being bounced around. And so that's a common neurological condition that can cause memory troubles. And of course, things that are growing in the brain that don't belong there like tumors are not, are not very good for their, uh, your memory. Metabolic syndrome, so thyroid abnormalities, electrolyte abnormalities like low sodium, low calcium, high calcium can all cause, now these are more reversible because you take the toxin away or you correct the abnormality, they improve. I'm gonna come back to the thymine because I, I talk about al um, alcohol dementia in a bit, but thymine deficiency leads to a, a specific type called Korsakoff's dementia, which has a, a very interesting feature called confabulation, where essentially they make up stories by pulling out all kinds of things together into a, a story that is so fluid and so believable that most of the time you wouldn't know it if you didn't have a collateral source. And I've had team team members that I work with that have been fooled and spent an hour list, writing down, detailing and writing down these completely fabricated um, stories that don't represent reality at all. Uh, medications, so narcotics and sedatives for sleep are the big culprits. Any cholinergic agents like some of the, the bladder antispasmodics can also cause cognitive impairment. But again, these are reversible because you, if you take away the medications, there's often a lot of recovery. And then all of the sleep disorders can affect memory, but again, reversible if they can be treated. And really it, it makes sense, right? If your brain is tired and not able to sleep, it's not gonna remember very well. And somebody asked about inflammatory disorders. So um, inflammatory disorders, not all of them are autoimmune, but it is a common one. And anything that, that can have an autoimmune response in the brain can, can uh, trigger damage and therefore dementia. So 
um, I can't tell, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the, what the risks, the rate of risks are for various types of autoimmune diseases, but it would not surprise me to find uh, a pretty, a pretty substantial association between them because it, they overlap so much. And of course, infections play a big role. So syphilis used to be a huge cause of dementia. It's much less common now, but we still test for it because it's, uh, it's, it's still out there. Um, there's a specific HIV-related uh, uh, cognitive impairment caused by the, the effects of the, the infection in HIV-AIDS. Uh, prions is, the, is what everyone knows colloquially as mad cow disease, although mad cow disease, Ameri uh, Canadian, uh, humans don't get mad cow disease. We get Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Cows get mad cow disease. But we, we can get the prion from the mad cow, and then it... it folds abnormally and gives uh, the syndrome of creutzfeldt jakob disease. It's very rapidly progressive and incurable. And then, of course, anything that infects the brain, viruses, funguses, um, inf um, bacterial infections can have a, a big impact on dementia, depending on how severe they are and how much damage. Psychiatric illness can masquerade as dementia, although often it is treatable. Um, we don't use the term pseudo-dementia nearly as much as it used to be used because uh, it is depression, it's not pseudo-dementia, and so we try to treat it, but it's still a useful term to highlight to people that this isn't really dementia, this is the effects of the depression. And then the alcohol is the interesting one. So we talked about that alcohol is a risk factor for vascular changes. Um, heavier alcohol use does increase your risk of, um, does increase your risk of cognitive impairment. Um, there's some studies that suggest there's a, the protective factor. So everyone's heard about their two glasses of wine a day. And there's some question about the validity of those studies and whether they're really, really showing what they are purported to have sh shown. But there, there does seem to be some protective factor. Interestingly, also coffee, uh, moderate amounts of coffee, uh, high to moderate, moderate to high amounts of coffee consumption are thought to be uh, in some studies protective for dementia, so the Tim Hortons is, uh, is still good. Thiamine deficiency though, that's that Corsica. So if, if thiamine is B, uh, vitamin B1, uh, and often Corsikoff gets mixed up with alcohol-related dementia because a lot of people who are, are chronic, chronic users of alcohol have thiamine deficiency because of their, their dietary deficiencies. And so it's very common for alcoholics to develop Korsakoff syndrome because of the thiamine deficiency. But even without the thiamine deficiency, there is a specific entity, uh, used to be called alcohol-related persisting dementia, um, which is kind of a redundant term because if it's dementia, it has to be persisting. So um, alcohol-related dementia is a lot, in a lot of ways, very much like the um, frontotemporal behavioral variant in the way it presents. A lot of frontal symptoms because the alcohol specifically affects the largest part of the brain, which is the frontal lobes, where you get that the disinhibition and the giddiness and the loving everybody in the room kind of symptoms from intoxication. So the rest of this, I've got a couple of questions, uh, two that are related to actually hoping that you, I've I've communicated clear learning and you can pick out the right answer, and the other one, which is another shot at teenagers, that I'm hoping you'll like. <laughs> all right so in a patient with dementia which so keep in mind they have a diagnosis of dementia which of the following scenarios or histories is most common most consistent with a diagnosis of alzheimer's disease so which is the alzheimer's patient in those five Still have quite a few folks still still with us. Yeah, pretty much everyone's here still. So that's yeah, really number, some of them slowly ticked down, but not a lot. That's good. Yeah. Well, hopefully that means I was I was amusing and engaging. Yeah, absolutely. You were. <laughs> All right. So how are we doing with this one? Okay, I'll end the poll there. All right. Let's share the results. There we go. Yes, most people got it. So gradual onset with progressive course, no clear neurological or systemic symptoms otherwise. So we're gonna to skip to the next one before I explain some of the other points because it's basically the same question, but for vascular dementia.
So of course, it, I, it didn't occur to me until just now, but now everybody knows that number two isn't the right answer. <laughs> Although that's actually that's not completely true because what I based on what I told you that uh, most of the cases are um, are tiny strokes. Ah, ho! Oh, look at that. Lots of folks got that one. Yeah. So I'll walk through the rest of them. Um, so yes, two previous strokes, purely controlled diabetes and hypertension, big risk factors for strokes. Chances are that that's vascular dementia. So the five-year history of slowed movement, resting tremor, shuffling gait, recurrent falls, and visual hallucinations is pretty consistent with, with either Parkinson's disease, dementia, or di dementia of Lewy bodies, depending on the timing between when they had the dementia and when they developed the, the, the Parkinson's symptoms that are described there. The, the frequent falls in urinary incontinence, that's the, that near... Um, Normal pressure hydrocephalus with the, the classic triad of confusion, falls, and urinary incontinence. And then the last one, the major personality change, poor judgment, and fairly well-preserved me memory is either a teenager or a frontotemporal dementia be behavioral variant. And then my final one, which is again a shot at the teenagers. And I think this one, oh, this one, oh, you didn't have the, this one wasn't a multiple choice one. I thought this one would work yeah, good as a multiple yeah, choice yeah. one, but that's okay. <laughs> it's really there just to have a little bit of a laugh before we finish off. Yeah. We have so many wonderful questions coming in from people. All right. Well, that's good. We, I can stick we around for questions. Quick rapid fire uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> all right all right i'm really curious to see where everybody went oh there we go girls mature faster yes <laughs> they do they do probably mature faster and my mine my 17 year old certainly doesn't have frontotemporal dementia although she very occasionally exu exudes individual uh symptoms so yeah. uh and i was going to have another question about do you remember the colors on the tree but i thought i'd spare you from that and but I bet you if we did do a question that most that we'd have a much much more accurate set of responses and a lot more folks would would remember what the what the colors were. So I'll leave you to dic to to decide if you remember it accurately or not. All right, so we've got some questions. Yeah, we got a. I'll I'll just pick maybe three. There's okay. some awesome ones coming in from everyone. So sorry we couldn't get to every every question. Uh, one of them uh, is, uh, what is the right answer if an 80-year-old lady with dementia asks you where is her father or her mother? Ah, uh, yes, that's a common one too. That's a really tough one. And it, it's hard to give you a, a right answer because it's so dependent on the individuals. What I often coach families to say, well, so the, the question often is is different for families and staff too, because staff can also often defer and go, well, gee, I don't, I'm not really sure. I can ask someone about that and find out where they are. Um, families will sometimes use phrases like, oh, well, they're in a, in a safe place or they're in a good place. Um, or I'm not sure, I haven't seen them for a while, but I'm sure they're fine. Uh, often with dementia, especially in that moderate range where they're they're really distressed by by the things they don't understand around them, I often tell families that the, the little white lie becomes your your friend. So you have to ask yourself. Mo a lot of people want to tell the truth, and and there's good reasons for that. But when you're talking about folks with dementia who are distressed by potentially distressed by the answer, a good rule of thumb or, or guideline that I like to use is what's the benefit for them? If they ask, if they're talking about their husband and wondering when he's going to come home and he died last year, what's the benefit to them to reminding them again that their husband died and to rip that, that scab off and make it fresh like he just died once again? And, and that's where the, the white lie often becomes the, the friend and, and something reassuring. And there, there are ways to, to lie about it without truly lying, but it often really helps to, to reduce their overall distress and, and upset. So yeah, that's a, that's a tough one for sure. That's a great question. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we've all seen instances of that. Yeah. Um, another question. Uh, what do you think of the work of Dr. Dale Bredesen, Dr. Daniel Amen, and Dr. David Perlmutter? Hmm. No, I don't know any of those were names, oh, okay. so I can't really answer I, that. I think they had a TED Talk out there. Uh, like okay. Something around uh, like the most important lesson I learned from 83,000 brain scans. Oh, okay. That sounds really interesting. And let me, let me write down those names because the fact that I don't know them suggests that I have some catching up to them. <laughs> so give me one of the names. I can Google them. Um, that'll... Is, uh, uh, D Daniel Amen. Sorry, what was the last name? Amen. Amen. Yeah. A-M-O-N? A-M-E-N. E-N. All right. Oh, Dr. Amen. Okay. Uh, another see. question. Uh, what can a caregiver do to make someone with dementia do something when all that person wants to do is lie down? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one, too. Um, yeah. It, again, we, we get down to that that my, my standard answer is often it depends on the person, but there's lots of different strategies. So some, some people will go with bribery. Um, bribery can work, having a treat or something. You always have to worry, you have to be careful of, especially the folks with, with uh, diabetes, because getting, getting them to do stuff by bribing them can often mean they won't do something unless you bribe them. Um, sometimes the way you phrase a question or, or an invitation, um, this will work for some people and not for others, is if you approach it as, come on, it's time for, instead of, would you like to go to? Um, because if no is an easy answer, then uh, they'll often go to that. And if it's, come on, it's time for, you may still get a no and it may not work, but sometimes that'll prompt them if, if, you're, if you're there and, and, come on, I'm going to go with you to something. That will sometimes work better for families. It's kind of like when you have little kids and if you do you want a hot dog no do you want a hamburger no do you want crafting or no but if you go hot dog or hamburger pick one and you might get a you might get an answer and so but yeah it's it is a real challenge and and the being enthusiastic and 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 being cajoling can sometimes work it's in the severe apathies though there it's a real real challenge we do sometimes use medications but a lot of the times the medications have more drawbacks than the apathy do does and so it's not super common and i don't know if if my colleagues are going to touch on that but it is uh, there is things that may help with it in terms of medicines but it's often approach and a lot of trial and error yeah the next uh, talk is is going to be a bit more about that next month yeah. all right well thanks so much for your presentation dr thomas uh, it was definitely lived up to my hype of being engaging and funny and informative. So, <laughs> well, I'm very impressed with the participants and how how engaged they were, and, and yeah. asking a lot of really good questions. I hope I I answered them well. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to. And see I'm going to I'm going to go look up Dr. Daniel Amen now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've left the link to the post session survey in the chat here. I'm also going to email it out along with the recording of the presentation and the PowerPoint slides as well. So I can look forward to that. And thanks again, uh, Gord. Thank you. Yeah, I'll see you around. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. I just have to figure out how to end it. Oh, I got that. <laughs> oh, you got that. All right. That's why I can't tell. Bye. All right. Bye. <laughs>